What's the rudest thing a guest has ever done in your home? Story one, gratitude is key. This sounds easy, but let me explain. The key is that gratitude is not a balancing test. Don't just be grateful the extra things your spouse does. Be grateful for every single thing. If you shop for food, then prep it, cook it, then clear the table, then load the dishwasher, then clean all the pots and pans, and then later your spouse empties the dishwasher, thank them for doing that and feel it. To me, this is a hard thing for people to do, and it is such a huge part of the happiness in marriage. It leads to a feedback loop of appreciation for the little things as well as the big. It makes it more likely that your spouse will appreciate you and, unless you married a terrible person, far more likely that they will do more. You will also see more of the things they do. This isn't just stuff, but anything. Grateful for listening, for sharing, for sitting on the couch, for having your child, etc. Etc. Story 2. Happily married 27 years here. Here's some of what I've learned along the way. The marriage is more important than the wedding a reception. Disagreements are not you versus me. They're us versus the problem. Shared goals, including finances, kids, careers, etc., are more important than shared hobbies. Close relationship is important. It's not everything. But it's important. It's great to love the person you're marrying, but hopefully you also like them. As in, if they couldn't be your spouse, for whatever reason, would you still choose them as a friend exactly the way they are now? Marry someone that you don't feel compelled to try to change into someone different. Story 3. 1. Premarital counseling from someone great too. When fighting, think of your entire relationship. Ask yourself, is this going to matter over the course of the relationship? Probably not. 3. A trick to getting out of fights is to tell each other how important this issue is to you. You can use the one. 10 scale. Ask your spouse, how important is this? Because to me, it's a four. It's even easier if you go first. Honey, this is a nine to me. Or this is a two inches. Oftentimes we get into fights and don't know how to get out of them. Four. It's never you against your spouse. It's always you, your spouse against the problem. Story four. Married five years together, 12. One. Effective communication is the key to a healthy and happy relationship. If you haven't already, Learn how your partner deals with stress or anger, and learn together how to make it work for you guys. Ed, if I am mad, I need time to myself. My partner knows to let me cool down alone and will come to check on me after a few minutes. If I'm still not okay, I used to say fudge off, but now I say I need some more space because I know they're just checking in because they care. He, on the other hand, likes attention and comfort when he is mad. I've had to learn to be more affectionate in times of stress because of this, too. You are your own self. When you've been together a long while, it's easy for all your hobbies, interests, values, and beliefs to become exactly the same. That doesn't mean you aren't entitled to do things for yourself or have a differing opinion. Have at least one thing that is your thing to keep yourself sane and interesting. Story 5. Married 10 years here. 1. Expectations will ruin a marriage. Exponentially so if there is no communication. 2. Assume nothing. Your spouse is not in your brain, cannot read your mind, and cannot interpret passive aggressiveness with the intent that you're trying to deliver. 3. Your spouse is not responsible for your happiness, and you are not responsible for your spouse's happiness. 4. Get a hobby and make sure they have a hobby. Separate from your own. Have a hobby together, but also have something for yourself. 5. Keep your relationship private. If you have issues with your spouse, bring it to them. Not Facebook, not Reddit, not your mom. Take it to your spouse. Keep your troubles, dirty laundry, stress issues between the two of you. Six, listen, to understand, not to solve the problem. You're not Ben Jerry's. You can't solve all the problems. Just listen. You end up doing a world of good if you just reassure the other that you're available to them. Seven, money will be your downfall if you don't attack it together. Sit down, create a budget, get on the same page. Discuss how you're going to manage finances, who is paying what bills and when. Your five-year plan your 10-year plan, goals, aspirations, dreams of what you want to do with money and how you're going to get there. This should be a discussion at least once a month to ensure alignment and maintain track of your goal. Do this, and any money troubles you come upon, you will win over together and it won't tear you apart. Eight, put each other first. You're choosing to marry this person. That means you are quite literally choosing them over everyone else in the world, friends, family, people who have been in your life forever. If you're not prepared to do that for this person, do not marry them. I've seen my fair share of marriages disintegrate because one of the spouses felt threatened by a friend of their spouse, like cheating, 
or one of the spouse's parents doesn't care for the other spouse. Immoral, illegal, and or dangerous decisions aside, you should always side with your spouse when it comes to onlookers. Unless it comes to sports teams, and then a little healthy competition makes for fun bedfellows. 9. Dream together. One of the best things in life is being able to look forward to exciting things. If you can dream up something incredible with your spouse, it'll not only give you something to look forward to, but will keep that fire burning and remind you of your promise to one another. Story 6. Been married 17 years so far, together 20. Never rush marriage. At the end of the day, it's really nothing more than a piece of paper. What really matters is in your heart. Second piece of advice, they better be your best friend or it most likely won't work out. This is someone you'll be spending the rest of your life with if all goes as planned. And the older you get, the less friends you'll have and the more you'll spend with your significant other. If you're rich, a prenuptial should be mandatory. If you stay together, no harm, no foul. If you separate, well, you'll be glad you got one. Story 7. You can't fix everything. If someone has a bad day, there may not be anything outward that can be done to fix it. Sometimes they just need time and to know you're there. My wife has anxiety, and after endlessly trying to recommend solutions, the return that clicked was... Don't you think I've tried everything throughout my life? I stopped recommending things. I offer help, but largely let her do what makes her feel better. She doesn't get frustrated with all of my ideas that, in theory, somehow never occurred to her. I don't feel as though I failed to help by not coming up with a tangible solution. Story 8. Don't rush the wedding. Spend some time enjoying being engaged. Ideally, you never will be again. Waiting is a magical thing. It makes you asterisk work asterisk for what you want and gives you time to explicitly rationalize and express asterisk why asterisk you want it. It forces you to live in anticipation of this thing that you want, actively observing what life is like without it. This will give you exponentially greater appreciation for what you have once you've got it. It will keep you from ever taking it for granted because you'll always have a reminder. Plus, it gives you time when you've still got reasonable distance and accommodation to work through problems that may come to light once you're married. Not much changes once the rings are on aside from your perspective, so try to take some samples of it. If you don't live together, try it for a few days or a week. If you do, then you've likely already seen some potential points of contention. Address these early, because even those things that seem trivial now will grow with time. It could be forgetting to take the garbage out, or leaving wet towels on the floor, or their satanistic rituals in the basement. You'll save yourself a lot of trouble by getting things into open air early. Especially now, when you have every opportunity to take space and time apart if things get too heated or it takes a long time to reach a compromise. Also, compromise, possibly the single biggest and most important word in marriage. A willingness to compromise demonstrates that you love and respect someone enough to sacrifice something in order to reach a middle ground. Take the time to reach mutually acceptable compromises. They may not come quickly or easily, they may not be comfortable, and they may take some creativity, but asterisk, very asterisk, few problems are truly big enough that a compromise cannot be reached. Story 9. Remember that you are going into marriage not for funsies, but in order to be a better person. Occasionally this will happen because your spouse is inspiring you to greater heights of idealism and love. Much more often, it will happen because your spouse is giving you asterisk ahem asterisk and asterisk opportunity asterisk to be loving. Because she didn't have time for dishes, or didn't notice the milk on the counter, or really needs some alluring times tonight regardless of your headache, or is just in a bad mood tonight. A great deal of marriage is sucking it up and doing unpleasant things lovingly, recognizing that you create plenty of asterisk ahem asterisk opportunities for your spouse as well whether you notice or not, and never ever keeping score. Once you've stopped keeping score and made your whole life about the good of the family, marriage ironically becomes a lot more fun than it is if you go in just expecting it to be fun. Obviously, there are lines to be drawn here. Loving your spouse does not mean tolerating abuse or failing to communicate your needs. But marriage is mainly about giving up your life to caring for somebody else. That's what the vows say, after all. And I think we lose sight of that too often here in the early 21st century. Edit. Also, have a close relationship towel. Story 10. Been married nine months. I don't have a lot of sage relationship advice except this. Your partner is not your enemy. My husband said that to me before we were engaged. 
I was upset about something, and he calmly said, I'm not your enemy, and that's really made me reevaluate the things he does that bother me. That said, you don't have to blow $1.30K for your wedding. That's a down payment on a house. No one is going to remember what color your bridesmaid's dresses were or what flavor your cake was. They're going to remember how much fun it was, who got the most drunk, who had the worst dance moves, and how happy you, too, were that day. You are going to want to strangle each other during the planning process. Just relax, have a glass of wine or something, and talk it out. We spent less than $1.7K on our wedding and didn't have a single complaint. BBQ, beer, cupcakes, and good music. Edit, I know $1.30K is a laughable down payment in some places. My point is, you don't have to spend the equivalent of a down payment on one night of food, booze, and music. Unless you've got cultural traditions to upkeep, then do what you can so everyone is happy, including you. Story 11. Do a lot of those questions to discuss before marriage quizzes. You may find trigger points you never would have thought of on your own. It's better to hear these things in a theoretical, not in a time you need to make a decision or are under emotional stress. But most importantly, make sure you agree on whether to have kids. Don't assume he, she will come around to the idea. If you're pushing your significant other to have kids, you will basically be a single parent. They won't feel responsible for the child because they didn't want them to begin with and were being nice to you and having a baby. On the flip side, if you convince your significant other not to have children, you're setting yourself up for a lot of resentment. If they had to choose between you and a future, they've probably built up in their mind for most of their life. The decision of whether or not to have children impacts every single moment of the rest of your life. Don't try to convince someone they really will come to love the opposite outcome. Story 12. Communication is essential. If you have an argument, you might need a minute to yourself to collect your thoughts. Then, in a respectful manner, have a mature conversation about why you are upset. Asterisk. Also communicate feelings beforehand to prevent a big argument. Don't be selfish. Pick and choose your battles. Also make time for yourself so you can be the best you can be for your spouse. The little things mean a lot like having a beer already opened, picking up their favorite candy or drink while grocery shopping, cooking dinner for them. Keep dating. Date nights are essential. Life gets in the way, but make time for each other. Story 13. Together 13 years, married for nine. My wife is my person, Gray's Anatomy reference. She loves me even with all of my neurotic quirks, and same goes with me. We love to spend time with together as well as separately with our friends. We approach everything, parenting, financial decisions, heavy life things, as a team. We lived together for 1.5 years prior to being married, so we figured out all of the gross habits and homemaking tasks in that time. As far as dealing with heavy things that could impact your marriage, we hold hands in bed, in the dark, and talk about it. If we get pissed at each other, you can't see the other person's nasty, mean face, and it takes some of the potential for irreversible bad feelings away. We also text back and forth about stuff that we have emotional energy for during the day. We have a child, and it's really hard to have adult conversations when we get home from work. Oh, and when you have a baby, I highly recommend to alternate nights that you get up with the baby. This will save your marriage during early parenthood. This also means that you each get one weekend morning to sleep in. In the early days, we would live for the next night we got to sleep through. Lack of sleep was one of the biggest sources of bad feelings during the beginning of our child's life. Story 14. You have to choose each other every day. Marriage isn't the finish line. Don't forget what makes the other special, and don't lose what makes you special. Kiss a lot. Physical contact is good and builds your feelings of intimacy. Don't give up. Things get tough. People make mistakes. If you are both willing to work, a lot of problems can be worked out. You can fall back in love with each other. Be playmates. Find time to game or play chase, whatever. Just play. Don't expect your spouse to read your mind. Tell him, her, what you need and want. Don't get mad because they didn't divine it. Don't hold grudges. It helps nothing. It hurts everything. Apologize. Never let your pride get in the way of your marriage. Be a team. The more you build together, the more you build your relationship. Let your partner help you. Accept help when offered. Ask for help when needed. Learn about your spouse's interests. You don't have to love it, but give it a chance. Be kind, my husband, and I will be celebrating 21 years in October. Story 15. Be sure to talk about the big things and make sure you're on the same page. Do you both want to be married? Do you both want not want children? Are you religious? If you are different religions, what do you plan to do? If you have kids, which religion will they be raised as, etc.? Do you have specific life goals, plans, and is your partner aware of them? Where do you plan to live? 
Would you be okay relocating for your or your partner's job? Can you tolerate your in-laws? What are your expectations after marriage? Do you plan on keeping up a fitness routine, etc.? Are you having a joint account or are you keeping separate ones? Do you agree on potential future pets? Do you have any hobbies you can do together? Story 16. Communicate. Everything stems from this. The other person is not a mind reader. You can't read theirs, so don't expect them to read yours. You will have arguments and disagreements. This is normal. Take all the problems on as a team. It's not a me versus you thing. Y'all are on the same team working together towards a solution. It's not about winning this time. Everyone says marriage is 50-50. It's yes to an extent, but don't expect it to be an even field every day. Some days you may give 70% and your partner can only give 30% and that's okay because next week you might only be able to do 20% and they will pick up the slack. It really is give and take. The butterflies fade. This is totally normal too. That newly married honeymoon high will wear off and you may even struggle to like the other person 100% of the time. You will have to make a choice every day to love that person unconditionally, even on their bad days. The last bit I can offer, don't ever stop trying to win them over. Flirt with them, make them feel wanted. Find ways to show them you love them. My husband will bring me coffee, run a bath, get me random bouquets of flowers for no reason other than it being Tuesday. I will get him his favorite candy, pick up a movie or book he's been interested in. If he mentions he's been craving a certain meal, I make it. It's really the small things that say, hey, I have listened and learned the things that you love and makes you happy. Story 17. Talk about everything before you get married. You don't have to agree on any of it, but it's best to know where the other stands before marriage. Money. Dreams. Family planning. Do they want kids? If they want kids, how do you plan on disciplining them? How do you want them to be schooled? Is someone going to stay home or both work? Do you want to retire and move or retire and stay where you are? Y'all about past relationships that have messed you up. You don't have to go into details, but if it had a permanent effect on you, especially negative, they should know what to expect. Also, talking about all of this gives you guys an idea of how you communicate with each other, if you don't already have a good grasp on that. Also, my BL told my husband and I have an awkward night every once in a while. A night where you know things will be brought up that have been bothering you about the other, little or big, so you can clear the air. Story 18. As someone married 41 years, I have to disagree with many of the younger and less experienced people who have answered this post who say that it's just a piece of paper. Marriage is a sacred contract you make in front of God and all your friends and family that you will love the person through whatever comes along, that you will team together when life hits you hard that you will be there for them at their worst, and that they will likewise be with you in your darkest moments. If you're not ready to take these vows seriously, you should not take them at all. Picture this. You are married, and on the way to the honeymoon, you are in a car wreck. You are okay, but your spouse is now relegated to a wheelchair. You will need to feed them, change their diapers, arrange for their care while you're at work. You just promised, for better or for worse. Did you really mean it? If that scenario causes you to say, well, I wouldn't want to waste my whole life caring for that person, then you don't love them enough to enter into this serious contract. There will be those who disagree, but what is the success rate of the marriages among them? A few years after our wedding, my wife was struck by an incurable condition. We fought it together for 15 years before finally medication was developed that controls it to the point that she can function not quite normally although the med has the side effect that her body is now riddled with arthritis. Our children were tiny when this started, and their entire growing up years were while their mom was sick. I'm happy to say we are still together. Our kids are grown up and well-adjusted. Certain things we used to do together we cannot do, but we're now both in our 60s, so that was going to happen sooner or later anyway. I am so very grateful for my dear wife, my partner through life, and my best friend. Please don't reduce marriage to just a piece of paper. It is a contract, a set of vows you make that join you together for life. If you or the person you marry doesn't believe that, you have not yet found the right person and are about to settle for someone far less than the best. I wish you well in your marriage, and I sincerely hope that you don't enter into it without taking it very seriously. Story 19. Learn to communicate. Don't like something? Learn to say it in a way that comes across as explanative and not complaining. Also, learn to hear complaints or comments from the standpoint of understanding their point and not taking it personal. Disagreements over daily things should not get out of hand. Don't ever say something you wouldn't want said to you. You married them for a reason. Always remember that. 
Last close relationship is important, much like communication. My wife is my literal best friend, as I hate having to keep up with a social life, so all I can say is make sure you married your best friend, LOL. Oh, and don't ever, ever lie, even if it's small. Lies are like cracks in a wall. Once they start, you must stop it or it'll crack the entire foundation. Story 20. Your relationship should be as unique as the individuals in it. Don't do things just because they're traditional, expected of you. Other couples you know do it that way, etc. Be traditional, be unconventional, be a combo of both as long as you both agree. This is a situation where reinventing the wheel is okay. In fact, you should regularly assess and reinvent as needed. You do you, not your parents, not your friends, not movies, not fairy tales. As other people have mentioned, it's going to get boring. Remember that your spouse is probably as bored as you. Just tough it out. Keep your own bank account. A joint account for joint expenses, sure, but keep some of your own money. Story 21. I might end up repeating some of the things you Shuboni says if he posts here. So my apologies. Communication is truly important, and without it, you are doomed to fail. Hash out all of the little things now. Most people know to work out the major things, but few people seem to think about the small stuff that doesn't seem like a big deal until it compounds into a serious problem. Things like not replacing the toilet paper or using the last of something and not telling your spouse gets pretty annoying after the 70th time. Health insurance. If you both work and have insurance, see if it will be more cost-effective to switch to one or the other's plan after marriage. Also compare what's offered at your respective places of employment. Sure, his plan may save you $400 a year in premiums, but if the deductible is $800 more and doctor's visits cost twice as much, are you really saving? Banking, similar thing. If you chose to combine finances, who has better perks? It makes more sense to go to the bank or credit union that either interest rates on savings accounts and CDs is highest and loan rates are lowest. Oregon, that one of you has a longer history with IE. One of you has been with Chase for eight years and the other has been with Bank of America for six months. Close relationship. Some of this may be controversial. I will not apologize. It is not just for making babies, and you do not have to have children as soon as you get married. No, that is not open for discussion. No, it does not matter how badly your parents want grandbabies. Simply put, you should not feel pressured into having children. Enjoy being married for more than five minutes. Get the hang of working as a unit first. Maybe get a pet together. Explore yourselves if you aren't having close relationship yet. Having an idea of what things feel like will make your wedding night less awkward for you both because it isn't you both having to learn what you like. If you are having close relationship, explore each other some more. Trust me, there is more to be discovered. The wedding itself. It doesn't have to be big or fancy, and I seriously recommend sitting down and thinking about what you would rather have. A $30,000 wedding or 20% down on a $250,000 home. I think that about covers it for advice I would give. We've been married for a little more than three years. We have a three-month-old daughter. We don't fight. We don't call each other names or put each other down, and all of those things matter. At the end of the day, you guys need to be a team. And if you remember that, it doesn't matter what happens because you'll be able to get through it together. Story 22. Arguing is not scary or dangerous if you can trust one another to be reasonable, open, and honest. In fact, if such trust exists, arguing can be a productive experience, occasionally even pleasant. You're just as stupid as your spouse. Maybe if you put your heads together, you can cover for each other's stupidity. Don't be with someone who isn't better than you at several important things. If you're pursuing someone because they're innocent and harmless, chances are you're using them to cover up for something. You should be intimidated by how incredible your partner is. That makes them much more interesting and prevents you from getting arrogant. Don't enter your marriage thinking you get to stay the same. If you love them, you don't get to stay the same. Learn to tell the difference between what is you and what is simply a habit. You are not their source of happiness and fulfillment and meaning in life. Maybe you can help them pursue meaning. But you're not even close to important enough to be that meaning. Nobody is. Don't put up with their nonsense because you're a good, patient spouse who puts their needs above your own. Nobody is a good, patient spouse if given enough time to fester. Short of you changing your perspective, it will eventually pile up and destroy your relationship as you begin to resent them over stupid nonsense. Assume you're wrong, because let's face it, you probably are. Then think about it. If you can honestly say you've thought about it and still think you're right, then you're ready to have a conversation. Communicate when you're having trouble communicating. Ask for a short break to think and then come back to it as quickly as you can. You're probably going to have to talk about money, close relationship, and expectations a lot.
Ask for the bare minimum that you need to be satisfied. Don't ask for less. Story 23. Just married last week, but we've been together for nine years, so I have a few tips. 1. Live together for a minimum of six months before you marry. You need to know you can live together, and if you do want to spend the rest of your lives together, then waiting an extra year or so is nothing in the grand scheme of things. 2. Go to wedding fairs and open days for venues. You can get good deals on venues from open days. We got 500 pounds off our dream venue by booking within two weeks of the open day. 3. Think of access for disabled guests. Please consider this if you have any friends or family with limited mobility. Is there step-free access? Are there adequate disabled toilets? Disabled parking? Space in the ceremony room for the wheelchair to be alongside the other chairs? 4. Get all the help you can for wedding planning. Make detailed notes and files. Have a solid timeline of when things need to be done. Remember some things like cake makers you may need to book a year in advance as some can get very fully booked. 5. Marrying on a weekday is so much cheaper than a weekend. For us, we did a Tuesday. Venue alone was 1,250 pounds. If we wanted a Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, the venue on its own would have been 5,600 pounds. 6. Send reminders to your guests so they boom time off work if needed. We had people drop out weeks before the day because they couldn't get the time off and hadn't booked it sooner. E. There are. R. 7. If you have a problem with your partner, no matter how small it is, talk to them about it. They may not realize they're doing something that bothers you, like squeezing the toothpaste from the middle of the tube, not the end, like some kind of savage. 8. Seriously talk to your partner. About everything and anything. Listen to them, too. Find compromises, but never compromise who you are as a person. You should both be happy to be with each other and lifting each other up to be the best you can both be. Support each other through good and bad, every day. Even when it is tough, especially when it is tough. If you want any more advice, I have tons. We have been through a lot together. Long distance, house moves, holidays to places we don't know, bereavement, money troubles, mental health, physical health. And through it all, we love each other and are so happy to have finally married after nine wonderful years together. Edited for clearer formatting. Story 24. We will celebrate our 18th wedding anniversary in September. We've been together for 21 years. The biggest thing for us is trying to see the other person's side of things. We do not have to agree, but we will not stoop to disrespecting each other for opposing opinions, of which we have many. Also, don't try to be the same person. If someone only wants to be with you because you think and act exactly like them and only want to do the same things, that's not a partnership. It's ownership, IMO. Obviously, you have things in common. Celebrate those. Just remember that it's totally okay to be two different people. BTW, that last part comes from me watching almost every single one of my friends get divorced. They all seem to think they need to be with a clone of themselves, but you need someone to sort of balance you out, I think. Or you get hella bored. ETA, I agree with every single comment that says to remember that it's you two against the issues, not against each other. Always be a team. Story 25, live together first, or at least spend so much time together that you know all of the other's bad faults. But mostly, who you are now is who you are going to be after marriage. If you have a good, healthy relationship now, marriage will change nothing. And don't buy into what some people say about fighting being important for passion and intimacy. My wife never fight. We've certainly had disagreements although not many, truthfully, but we have never had a fight. Couples that insist that if you don't fight, you aren't in love, do not have the peace that my wife and I have in our marriage and home. It is okay to have separate interests. You don't have to do everything together. Jealousy is a useless emotion. You trust someone or you don't. If you have jealousy, I'd recommend going to a therapist and figuring that mess out. Story 26. Never go to bed angry is nonsense. Sometimes just you need to sleep and wake up in the morning fresh. Sometimes the entire disagreement is gone after a good night's sleep, as you'll realize that sometimes you were both just tired. And if it hasn't disappeared, usually you're in a better headspace to be rational about it. Communicate for God's sake. Don't let little annoyances that aren't spoken of build up until it becomes a huge thing that started over something tiny and easily worked out if addressed early on. Make sure you're both pulling your weight around the house. Just because someone is better at something or faster doesn't mean they should have to do it every time. Make sure things get done without one person stuck with the lion's share of the job. Story 27. Learn how to say I was wrong and mean it. Both of you. Except that you will change. They will change. 
Change is growth and growth is human. There will be times when stress will push you apart. Find a way back to each other, for better or worse, in sickness and in health. You will think about these words a lot over the years. Coming up in 20 years myself this year. When she pushes a grocery cart away in a store and out of sight, I can be overwhelmed with longing. I can also feel relieved to see her out the door for work and leaving me be for a few hours. These are not contradictory emotions for married people. Have kids. It's worth it, I promise. Story 28. My wife and I have been married going on 21 years and we've never had a real argument. I've never raised my voice to her and she's never raised her voice to me or anything like that. We respect each other and have never tried to control what the other does. Like if my wife wants to go run around with our kids and I don't feel like it, it's all good. She never makes me do anything I don't want to do and vice versa. If we have an issue, we just talk about it and no one gets loud or rude. If you have to constantly work at being married and being married is hard, perhaps you married the wrong person. Just try and be as sure as possible that the person you're going to marry is the right person. Story 29. Don't do it. Don't get married. I'm in a wonderful marriage, and I married the perfect man that I met in high school, and we've been married nearly 17 years. We have a lovely home and two great kids and a good life. However, marriage is such a struggle. A good marriage requires a lot of work, daily work. You don't get a good, solid marriage by being lazy, and it doesn't just happen. I had no freaking clue what I was getting myself into when I got married. I don't think anyone who hasn't been married can really be ready. The first year was hell. The seventh year was hell. The tenth year nearly broke us, and the fourteenth year had us hating each other. Neither of us are quitters, so we are stuck with each other. I think most others would have split by now. I frequently tell myself that if anyone asks me for advice about marriage, I will recommend staying single. At least till you're 40 plus. So much heartbreak and stress would be avoided if marriage was a non-option till people are fully grown and set in their ways. Story 30. Happily married for four years, and I just saw one of my tweets from a year ago that said, get you a relationship where if you ask, are we okay? The other person answers, yeah. And that's the end of the conversation, and you can go back to doing awesome stuff like sharing guacamole or playing rivals for Catan. There's nothing more draining to a relationship than playing the you-should-automatically-know-why-I'm-hurt game. It's not fun, and you waste so much time when you could be doing something awesome. Also, we have a rule in our house that we're best friends first and married second. If he needs some time alone, it's my job as his best friend to let him have that. It takes a lot of the responsibility for each other out and lets us relax and each be our own person and focus on what we love about spending time together. It also means my life with my husband doesn't have to look like someone else's relationship because they're just married. We're best friends first, always. Story 31. Talk about money and how you plan to handle household expenses, savings, goals, etc. Once you're married, make sure that you are on the same page. Make sure the wedding works for you too, and only you. Your family should have no say in the matter unless they're kicking in, and even then you should make it clear that their input will be received as advice and nothing more. Speaking from experience, for some odd reason weddings and babies result in various family members having all these feelings about what you should do. Let it be known that the wedding is about you, your partner, and no one else. Beyond that, you don't give a oh no and anyone who doesn't like is free to not come. This goes beyond just getting married, but your relationship is your business. Do not, and I repeat, do not discuss it with anyone that is not your SO. Learning how to communicate with your partner, even when things are difficult, will only strengthen your bond. Also, and much like what I said about the wedding, learn to terminate unsolicited input with extreme prejudice the moment it comes up. Understand that if you don't, people will feel entitled to an opinion, which will cause all sorts of issues in your household. Bonus tip, for the love of God, don't talk about your relationship on social media. Of course, this doesn't apply if you're in an abusive relationship. In which case, absolutely talk to a trusted party and seek help. Marriage is not the end of your courtship. Remember what it took for you to get your person and keep doing it. Date, go on vacation together, keep your physical appearance up, all that good stuff. Story 32, mutual respect is so important. This means open communication, trust, and support. It also means that you're each able to be an individual in addition to each other's partner. It's healthy for each of you to have your own things going on. Not in a leading separate lives kind of way, but in an occasional time apart kind of way. You just need to find the right balance. You also need to be on the same page about all of the big things. Kids, where to live, finances, future goals, etc. 
I feel like that should go without saying, but my husband and I know an engaged couple that haven't talked about whether or not they want kids, let alone when to have them. From the sounds of it, they have some pretty differing views. Wishing them the best of luck on that one. Story 33. 20 years here. The golden rule does not apply to communication. Treat other people the way you want to be treated, you know? Instead, you should learn how they want to communicate and do that. Talk to people the way they want to be talked to. I'll give you an example. I'm very literal and I like facts. If my wife were to say, I'm mad you never take out the trash, I would be confused because I can accurately recollect numerous times I have taken out the trash. However, if she said, you forgot to take out the trash again last night and I'm upset, then that would make sense to me and I would understand what she was upset about. Story 34. Most of what I've learned in almost nine years of marriage is communication-based, as suggested above. Learn how your partner communicates naturally. This can be a love language, sounds like self-help nonsense, but actually kind of true, or how they act, react when they're sad, slash angry, slash etc. Together we learned that if he hurts me, I pull away and want to be left alone for a while. He can apologize, but I need time to forgive. Also, just a practical thing, get a calendar. Make sure all your regular activities are on there, as well as anything out of the ordinary. So much easier to plan days slash weeks slash dinners slash events when you know what time they'll be home normally. Color coding helps me, but I'm sort of super organized like that. Story 35. There's no reason to feel like you're in a competition with your partner. You're both in this journey together as a team and not as competitors. When one wins, so does the other. Communication is key to everything. If something doesn't sit well, talk about it and never hold what you feel in. Sometimes it's easier said than done, however, in order to grow a stronger connection and partnership, it's imperative to speak to each other honestly. Always come from a place of empathy and understanding. Always say, I love you, even when you're angry, and never say things in anger. Words are powerful, almost spell-like, so it's necessary to be extremely careful about what you say not only to yourself, but to your SO. Words matter. Spend time together and don't pull out the phone, etc. Enjoy each other's company. Each morning and evening, my husband and I are adamant to have some time to ourselves and just talk and listen to each other. It could be about anything. Remember the reasons why you fell in love with each other. Discover ways to keep that passion going. Good times are great, but it's the bad times that develops the foundation. As a team, you will face disagreements, but the goal isn't to give up, but instead to understand and grow from the painful experiences, to stick with each other through thick and thin in order to grow together as a unit. Story 36. For him. You will need a surplus of gifts for her. From a simple gemstone bracelet to pretty costume jewelry and a couple more expensive. Why? At some point you will screw up. Real or asterisk her perception asterisk. You will want to grease up the love from the disappointment. Like her saying it's our nine-month anniversary. Could very well be an X anniversary. She's going to expect something indicating you care. Keeping notes. Don't be like that guy who goes shopping for Christmas gifts the day before the holiday. You had all this time that you squandered. A surplus of gifts makes life easier. Her perception? Guys who live with their girlfriends and husbands know this too well. Waking up from sleep because she has punched slash slapped slash smacked you in bed. Asterisk. Why? Asterisk. She had a dream where you did her wrong and is pissed off at you. Asterisk from a dream asterisk. Head shakes. I'm in my 40s. That still makes no sense. Story 37. You are not in charge of each other's happiness. You can bring joy into one another's lives, but you cannot make each other happy. You can only make yourself happy, and that's by being truly yourself. Also, if you have a reoccurring fight, try journaling to each other about it to minimize unproductive talk. My husband and I also stopped spending money on greeting cards. Instead, we have a big cutesy notebook journal that we write letters to each other on important occasions like birthdays, anniversaries, Valentine's Day, other holidays, finding out we were expecting our daughter, etc. Really anything significant. It means so much to have all our milestones in our journal than loose greeting cards everywhere. We started it on the day we got married. I think I pre-journaled some other important events like our first meeting and engagement in the journal for it to truest be our love story. For our daughter's first birthday this weekend, we decided to start a journal for her. We wrote her birth story, sparing the graphic details, in the notebook and wrote a letter for her first birthday in it and will continue as long as we can. Congratulations! Story 38. I'm divorced. My advice, take care of each other. Believe each other. Trust each other. If you can do that, there won't be any reason not to. Remember, you are vowing to stick with each other for richer or poorer, in sickness and health, for better or worse. Sometimes that can be hard. If one of you is struggling, the other should ask, how can I help? 
The answer is often, I don't know. The response to that is, I'm here for you, whatever you need. Don't get judgmental of each other's struggles. Just strive to help each other through it. I never planned to marry again because my marriage was a train wreck. However, I do have a partnership, and we do these things for each other. We will likely be together forever. Story 39. For dating engaged couples. Talk about children, number and how to raise, religion, politics, and money. Remember, this is a great time to discover any differences between the two of you. You may not agree on everything, but don't expect them to change on any of these. My wife says you can learn a lot about a person when they're with their family, when they're in a stressful situation, and when they're doing manual labor. Certainly don't force the stressful situation, but pay attention to how they act in each of these situations. As for marriage advice, never joke about divorce or separation. This can make a divorce or separation seem more like an eventuality. When seeking advice, make sure the advisor's goal is to help your marriage not to reinforce yours or your spouse's ideals. This makes a lot of personal friends not good at giving marriage advice in times of disagreement. Focus on intentions. If I'm upset with something my spouse did, I try to think of their intentions rather than the action itself. Did they intend to hurt me? Etc. When things get heated, not in a good way, things tend to blow up based on one another's attitude. Usually my spouse or I will say, I'm acting emotionally because you're acting emotionally. Let's just make an effort to stop acting emotionally, take 30 minds, and come back to discuss this. Always give your spouse the benefit of the doubt. They're fallible and will make mistakes just like you will. Expect nothing from your spouse and be happy with anything they give into the marriage. That way you're never disappointed. A piece of marriage advice I received was, never be too settled to get your spouse a glass of water if you're laying in bed together. Basically, self-sacrifice becomes more important than personal comfort. Always be transparent and be willing to communicate. Learn each other's love language and display love to one another using their love language. Make a budget immediately and both of you need to stick to it. I may think of more and add some edits down below. Story 40. Whoever came up with the idea that couples should not go to bed angry is an idiot. Getting a few hours distance on an argument can help put it into perspective. Forcing yourself to stay awake, getting more and more delirious, will never lead to the most rational and thoughtful conversations. My wife and I have come up with a system where if we are having an argument, and we are just spinning our wheels getting more and more frustrated, one of us can pull the ripcord. Basically, it means we need to take 30 minutes, one hour, three hours, rest of the night, to back off and calm down. I'll admit that when my wife is the one who pulls the ripcord, it is very hard to stop mid-argument and walk away. I'll think to myself if she just asterisk listens asterisk to me, she will understand. But I respect the rules we laid out, and every time, with some space, we have worked out our issue that meets both people's needs. Story 41. My cousin and her daughter, who has Down syndrome, were visiting and staying with me in my home. Her kid pooped in a quilt. And for some reason, my cousin rolled it up and shoved it in the closet in the guest room without telling me. I discovered it after they left. It was rolled up pretty good, so I didn't smell it immediately, because my dog stood in front of the closet and barked nonstop until I came and found it. She was so offended by it and didn't stop barking until it was completely cleaned up. Ha <laughs> ha. Edit. I called her and said, I found the quilt from your bed rolled up with poop in the closet. What happened? And she said, oh, daughter had an accident. Sorry, story 42. My boyfriend invited a couple dudes over while I was at work because we only have a one-bedroom apartment and I don't always enjoy sitting there watching them game. It was considerate. Anyways, he was asleep and they were gone when I got home since I work third shift. I noticed my new bathroom mat was discolored and assumed it was from shoes and didn't closely observe. Anyways, I made him look at it with me when he got up because I was a bit mad since it was brand new. Upon further observation, we came to the conclusion that before leaving, his friend wiped cow all over my new bathroom mat. It turned out to be brown finger streaks across the whole thing. Threw that out immediately. The toilet paper was readily available, BTW. They are not allowed in the apartment anymore, and it was weird because they weren't on bad terms. They actually wanted to hang out again. Story 43. So I was away for the weekend, and my roommate had some friends over for drinks. Problem is, when he drinks, he often blacks out, which he did before ensuring all his friends had left. In the morning, he discovers two friends stayed the night in my room. Not cool, but at least they didn't drink and drive, I guess. So not initially in rage, but when I finally make it home, I discover blood that is very clearly from period-close relationship on my duvet cover. Not whoopsie started in the middle of the night puddle, 
but edge of the bed on top smeared around. And we're not party college kids, we're all mid-thirties with real jobs, and what one might assume is a little bit of respect. They're not welcome back. Story 44. I had a house guest invited by a roommate have a psychotic breakdown. He literally came into all our rooms, rummaged through our drawers, and left anything of close relationship value on top of the dresser or nightstand as if to announce that he went through it all. Rubber band, lube, birth control pills, etc. He found ways to expose himself and walked in on my roommates having close relationship. We kicked him out inside of 48 hours. It should have been sooner. We changed the locks. We actually all knew this guy and hosted him before, and he was great. We were cleaning house a few months later and found a bag of his pubes. Story 45. Oh, I forgot this one. A friend of a relative stayed with my parents for a week. The guy was Argentinian, late 50s. He was very old-fashioned, religious, etc., for example. He even told my parents that it was wrong that I was living with my boyfriend without being married. One day he asked my mom to use her PC to check his email was in there for quite a while. Read. You guessed it, he was watching censored photos, but I guess he didn't remember the website he wanted because he first Googled in Spanish, young ladies with dark hair having close relationship, and a few variations of that. My mom found all that in her internet history, called him out. He tried to blame my, then 16-year-old brother, who had his own PC, speaks mostly English, wouldn't have Googled in Spanish, and was away in a camping trip. He wasn't welcomed back. 